19 people were killed after fire swept through a low rent and overcrowded accommodation block in Beijing's new airport south of the city. Most of the residents were migrant workers, people who moved from China's rural areas to the cities to work. Well, Beijing authorities launched a 40 day eviction campaign targeting those accommodation centers. The group worst affected by this campaign are those migrant workers. Many are now left homeless, just as the temperature outside is plummeting in the capital. Others are returning to their hometowns with as much of their possessions as they can carry, which is, isn't very much. Was the sudden eviction of so many people the best possible response after the fire? How reliant is the economy on migrant workers? And how would China realize President Xi's vision of a moderately prosperous society for all? To talk about these questions and more, join me in the studio is Claire Pearson, the international director of DLA Piper Law Firm, and also Victor Gao Zhukai, current affairs commentator of CTTN. And that's our topic. This is Dalak. I'm Zoe. Before we start, let's look at this. A once thriving industrial village reduced to rubble after 19 people died in a fire in this cheap rental apartment. Home wants to over 400 migrant workers. This cramped space here is where the migrant workers had lived, possibly for a whole family. There's a bed, a wardrobe, a toilet, a kitchen, though a small one, a television. They have everything they need. Except that safety conditions were not up to standard. This apartment had a basement for cold storage on its lower floor, workshops and restaurants on the ground floor and residential rooms on the second and third floors. All 19 people died from carbon monoxide poisoning, which authorities suspect come from the burning of materials used for refrigeration. Buildings simultaneously used for housing, storage and production are not fit for living. There's no way around it. Which is why the Beijing government has started a 40-day citywide safety check to crack down on illegal buildings. Many migrant workers live in them as rent is cheap. But now they have to move out in a hurry. We got the notice on November 21st, and we have to empty the space by 26th. It's not only tenants who are affected. Ms. Qin has run the convenience shop for years. Residents living right above her shop say if Qing's gone, life will also be harder for them. But other members of the community shared their concerns about fire safety. There are definitely safety hazards. There was a fire even the year before last in the basement of Block 10. It's a mess down there. The 40-day safety check has turned into a controversy far more complicated than just tearing down illegal buildings. As migrants who live and work in them will now have to think about where to go next. Xu Mengqi, CGTN, Beijing. Okay, a deadly fire uh, in the suburbs, which housed many of the migrant workers. Uh, it killed uh, 18 people there. That's why there was a widespread campaign all over Beijing. Actually, it's about house safety. But in the end, many migrants, some say tens of thousands or even more, uh, are evicted. Well, what do you think of the response from the Beijing government, Victor? I think we mourn the death of lives in that uh, tragic uh, fire. And uh, the government had reasons to take measures immediately and promptly to deal with other similar situations. However, in this particular case, I think the local government most likely overreacted or reacted in the wrong way, mainly because by forcefully evicting people in overcrowded quarters in the suburbs of Beijing, you really result in having tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these uh, migrant workers and their families with kids in many cases outside in the streets without shelter, without protection. But you this have is the wrong thing but to But you do. have to admit many of those houses they live in are substandard houses which fail their um, fire hazard prevention standards. Absolutely. I think uh, the government in the very first instance should not have allowed these rental places to start and operate for so many months if not for so many years. Now they are overcrowded and you have lots of residents living in there mm -hmm. with leases for example and if you want to evict them you need to find alternative ways where these people normally 
relatively speaking, impoverished, mm. and with family members, including kids, to have alternative places to stay, at least for a while before they find alternative housing. Throwing them onto the streets is the wrong thing to do. Mm. Claire, uh, what do you think of the response from the government, and in a, such a speedy way? That's why people complain. They are simply uh, driven out of their homes in a short amount of time. Well, uh, I think that, I mean, it did happen at China's speed, and the government's reaction was unfortunate. Um, there have, has been this problem in our own country. Mm. For example, after World War I, a lot of soldiers came back from the front, and they arrived in the UK, and there was a lot of slum housing, not dissimilar to what's gone on in the Beijing suburb. So what they did do is they passed a parliamentary act for slum clearance in 1930. Mm. And that parliamentary act was passed by Arthur Greenwood. Why did they choose him? Because his parents were painters and decorators from a relatively poor part of the north mm. of England. So I think what happened in Beijing is very sad. But I find that when there is a funeral, people attend funerals and they think. They don't necessarily say anything, but they think, how, how could we have avoided this mm. catastrophe? And I think from these deaths, there is an opportunity for the government to reflect and come up with a measured policy that will ensure it doesn't happen again. So, so you think there is some legitimacy in government's response because fire hazards do exist in those houses. And this morning, another complex in Tianjin uh, broke fire and killed another 10 people there. Look, I'll be frank, I feel very sorry for these migrant workers and I think the first thing we should say is condolences to their families and particularly those who have not got children for this new year. But I also think that when there is a death we have to draw a line in the sand and we have to think how do we avoid this in the future. Mm. And I think the experts in homelessness, the experts in what they need to survive as immigrants are the immigrants. Mm. The people who should be consulted aren't necessarily the higher echelons of government, it's the lower echelon of worker. Mm. I they know should be consulted with they before be any decisions were made. These are people. These people need to be consulted. We're in the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. You need to talk to the people and say, what do you want? I know what they want because those migrant workers, they're my friends. Mm -hmm. And I asked one of them who went into an ant compound why she didn't live there for long. And she said, when she walked in, she is, she's about 28. She said, when she walked in, she's got a job at Amazon. Mm -hmm. Typical job. She said when she walked in, there were semi partitions in the room. Oh. So, first, that's where the hazards. She didn't feel be. physically safe, and second, she said there was no air. Now, obviously, there was enough oxygen to have a raging blaze, but there was no air, and there's a bad fridge, and there's bad connection. All she wants is a single room uh -huh. with a bed. She's happy to share her shower with 18 people. She doesn't mind having a shared shower block. She, you just need building regulations but, but, but to create this. in the end, this. it's still an economic issue. But can Beijing, a big metropolis, with uh, limited financial resources, provide safe and affordable housing to those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of migrants living here? I think you have a point. It's eventually a financing uh, situation. However, I think uh, Beijing being such a developed city and with a city government with a vast amount of resources at its disposal, it's also uh, allocation of resources. It's also whether the government agencies really care about these migrant workers who work so hard for years, if not for a couple of decades in China, in Beijing, involved in all kinds of projects in Beijing. These are not homeless people. These are not lazy people. These are not people who do not want to work. They want to work. They have been working in Beijing, and they are not paid in a handsome manner, and they cannot afford a decent place to stay with, and they can only find these lower rental places where they need to squeeze with many others. And I think the government really needs to think about it, not only in coming up with better standards, but also with a better way to care mm. about these uh, lower income people and make their living standards up to a par with what President Xi Jinping has been talking about, mm. a moderately prosperous society for all.
As you said, um, the Chinese top leaders has been paying attention to narrowing the gap uh, between the rich yeah. and the poor, those haves and those have-nots. Why those policies haven't been working so well for these migrants in Beijing? I think it's partially to do with business reasons. There's been an absolute mushrooming in the number of people who are delivering on behalf of companies like Jindong, Alibaba. You know, all the rich guys in Beijing, they want their good that they bought 1111 to their door. Mm. So in response to that business need, people are coming to the city to take the job. I don't blame them. Mm. But what they do... But some companies do provide safe housing some for their employees. I'll be honest, the hotels do. The areas which are good at this are people like the hotels and the restaurants. They understand what the staff need. Other companies aren't necessarily looking at the needs of the workers. I think what you need to start so with... So you think the government should make it mandatory for employers to provide housing? I think there has to be consultation with all stakeholders. The stakeholders of the government really need to consult are the people who are doing the jobs, the people at risk. It's the life and death for them. For the mm. companies, it's only profit and loss. But you need the, the workers, you need the bosses, you need the government, and you need civil society experts uh -huh. in homelessness to come and help you. I've brought two pictures. Mm -hmm. This is accommodation I have lived in. So I'm a migrant worker at some level. <laughs> yeah, I choose Where not to pay high rent. This, this is Helena May in Hong Kong. Do you know what the rent is? It's 2,000 HKD a month when I was there. So a I'm, month? Yeah, I'm a single person. I just want a bed, and I'm happy to share a shower with 20 people. So this is accommodation for single workers in transition. This central London, Highbury, again, one bed, shared bathroom, shared shower, garden, communal eating space. Mm. That, that you can pay £38 for a day, which if you're, trans if you're translating it into renminbi in China, it'd be about 39 renminbi per night mm -hmm. at a Chinese salary. So you think it's acceptable to those uh, migrant workers? 39 it's more acceptable. yuan per day. It's, I'm not, I, most of the migrant workers I know pay 500 renminbi a month. Mm -hmm. So I've consulted with the migrant workers because my friends are close to them and we consulted at the weekend. And, and who actually provided those housings and who paid for them? Yeah, this is very interesting. So this is PPP, Public Private Partnership. This is a business. So it is low You're cost. You're saying it makes money? It makes, the money that it makes goes back into the maintenance of the property. So it's a non-profit organization where some money comes from government, some money comes from charity, mm. and some money comes from the rent payer. But the difference is it happens within the context of legislation mm. that requires that the toilet is sewn, is, there's a toilet for eight, there's a shower for four, and that the bed is so close to the window. Mm. So there's the legislation, and then there's the execution of the building within oh. the context of safety but, legislation. But, but Victor, China and Beijing does have social housing programs. The problem is, many of the migrant workers, they are not entitled to such social housing. And this is really the paradox and the dilemma faced by many migrant workers who keep working for the prosperity and stability and development of many Chinese cities but who do not have access to these benefits and I think these need to be changed I think the government in many cities including in Beijing need to really think about these people and come up with effective ways to provide for their legitimate needs including standardization for example better ways of uh, uh, providing these facilities so that people do not need to worry about overpaying uh, for the housing uh, beyond their uh, legitimate income, for example. And also, I think there need to be a sufficient amount of inclusiveness so that no one is really left behind in China and no one is really going into substandard housing without standardized uh, provisions. But I think those decision makers in the government have one concern on the top of their minds. That's uh, they only have limited mm. resources. Big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, they're fiscally restrained to, to have so many uh, social housing programs that accommodate increasing numbers of immigrants coming to the city to work. 
this is a problem. However, if you look around in Beijing, uh, you have many, many luxury housing uh, buildings for sauna, for example, for other entertainment, etc., which is very wasteful for resources, uh, not only for the companies, for the consumers, but also on a societal base as a whole. So mm -hmm. the government need to really you are saying we should tax those rich people so to fund the projects? No, I think we need to come up with a better allocation of resources so that there will be sufficient amount of resources earmarked for these lower income people and they do not need to worry too much about their daily needs including uh, substandard uh, housing for example. Well, what about legislation like uh, Claire said? Uh, we have this is PPP programs that both private capital and the government pay some money to build houses for those people which can run at a marginal profit. Yeah. Absolutely. A major city like Beijing with many, many district level governments need to come up with a comprehensive way as to how many migrant workers uh, the city need to accommodate for, mm -hmm. what is the minimum standard of their housing, for example, and hygiene needs, and then come up with different sources of income or uh, revenue to provide for these basic standards. And I think given the Communist Party of China's very effective leadership, mm -hmm. once they identify this is the right thing to do, mm -hmm. they need to come up with effective solution. And I believe the government will be able to do this so long as they decide this is what they need to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, you've been watching dialogue on CGTN. We're talking about the immigrants here in Beijing, how they should be treated when the city develops as a fast speed. Don't go away. We'll be right back. So the Beijing is developing at breakneck speed, uh, but there is always a bottleneck. Um, for example, um, the city has actually put a seating on, on the population. It should be uh, no more than 23 million by the year 2020. Do you think this target uh, can be met with still so many immigrants and migrant workers uh, trying to come to the capital? Exactly how much is the population in Beijing is not certain because I think the system captures the registered residents more accurately. As for the migrant workers mm. who normally come here without being registered and who do not have a stable place to stay with, it's difficult to keep count as to how many of them are here working and living in Beijing. That's the so first they're not on the book, so that's why they're treated differently. Absolutely. Now, secondly, I think Beijing is talking, the central government of China is talking about transferring some of the non-capital city related functions to outside of Beijing. And this may cause an outflow of people in the coming years and coming couple of decades. And I think the government probably is also eager to do this readjustment as to how much people in certain categories need to be increased or decreased. And in this sense, I think this explains the recent rush to force some of these uh, migrant workers onto the streets uh, because of their over sensitivity about mm. fire safety. But as a result, many of these migrant workers have no other choices and they are now leaving Beijing. It is a pity and I uh, think and the it government seems the will government has taken notice this. of some of the complaints from the grassroots. The city party secretary said there shouldn't be a rush to move people out onto the streets. Uh, the government should provide guidance for those people when they're resettling elsewhere. Uh, because they are a big part of the city's economy and labor force. Beijing cannot go without them, can it? Absolutely. I think uh, a big city like Beijing need to come to a view as to, for example, for a certain amount of people, how many barbers you need, hairdressers you need, or uh, street cleaners you need, for example, uh, shoe shiners, shoemakers you need. And eventually we'll have a much more scientific allocation of people to different kinds of jobs. Mm. A city like Beijing cannot survive if you all of a sudden cut off a very large amount of people from the number of people working and living here because otherwise... Which we cannot afford to lose. Yeah, the society will misfunction eventually and then everyone will become a victim because of this misallocation of people in the city. And, and Claire, do, do you think in some way Beijing has mistreated uh, these people, low-income uh, service per people coming from the countryside in China? 
I think there's an immense amount of sympathy uh, towards the migrant workers because, I mean, for example, I was riding my bicycle last night and my hands were really cold and I had good gloves on and mm. the gentleman in front of me in the bicycle... A delivery man. Yeah, he, actually, I think he was um, a, a cleaner because on the back of his bicycle he had an industrial size uh, carpet cleaner mm. which is a very heavy thing to carry on the back of a bicycle mm -hmm. and I noticed he had no gloves on one hand was on his vacuum cleaner one hand was on his handlebar which isn't easy at night when it's minus 10 mm. and I looked at that guy and I thought yeah where's he sleeping tonight and I think there's a lot of people like me in the bicycle lane looking at this guy with a great degree of empathy mm. <laughs> because that's the guy who's maybe cleaning your house. The migrants are the oxygen of the economy in Beijing. Uh, uh, what do you make of the fact that despite these uh, conditions, they still hang on to live in, in, in the city of Beijing, which is not so welcoming to them? Well, I think these are sort of the superheroes of the system. I'll be sitting in a nice warm office and somebody will come down on a rope with a bucket cleaning the window. That's very nice for me. I can look out of the window. It's not very nice for him. He's risking his life, so I've got a better view. Any worker has a degree of empathy with another worker. And if you're an outdoor worker who's rebuilt Beijing for the Olympics, mm. who's rebuilt Shanghai for Expo, who's rebuilt Shenzhen for the financial economy, once you've built a city, do you deserve to live there? Mm. Maybe. Do you believe systematically there is a way uh, for the city to assimil assimilate them and, and accommodate them legally, uh, socially, economically? Yeah, when I moved to London, I lived on a windowsill not very comfortable it's a wide windowsill but it's a windowsill in a house that we were meant to have for four but we had for seven and we sublet because it made more money I had a group of Chinese friends in London they were selling the bed three times a day mm. so people slept in shifts this is London this is what happens people at the beginning of their career make serious economic sacrifice to survive mm -hmm. if they survive they move up the career ladder but these are the hardest workers in any economy. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, there's a lot of bosses chewing the fat, but there's not many migrant workers who are slack. Mm -hmm. I know that because effectively I've been a migrant worker from the and north of And they have a good chance of moving forward and moving higher the social ladder, you believe. Yes, because today in business, because the world is changing so quickly, you don't need to have a pile of degrees, you don't need to be you know, academically excellent, you need to have resilience. And resilience isn't something you're taught at university. It's something you learn through hardship. And I feel like the guy who's cleaning my windows, the guy who's carrying the vacuum cleaner on minus 10 on his bicycle, mm. that guy's got the resilience to rise through the social hierarchy if there's social mobility in the city. If a city has social mobility and opportunity mm. and meritocracy, it will be a success. But, but if the it na doesn't, it nationally, won't. actually, China's doing uh, things, what we call urbanization 2.0. We want to accommodate more uh, countryside populations into cities, but not into mega cities like Beijing and Shanghai. But the irony is that most of these immigrants want to work and live in mega cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Well, I think uh, for most people in the rural area in China, uh, because of the uh, over uh, density of the population in the uh, countryside and uh, the lower productivity of agriculture traditionally done, the uh, surplus labor force in the rural area need to go to cities, big or small, to find jobs. I think uh, coming to Beijing is a natural choice uh -huh. uh, because of many attractions of Beijing. But migrant workers can be found almost in any city, any big towns in China, big or small. Mm. And I think for a big city in China for many decades, we actually welcome migrant workers coming to Beijing. And mostly they do works and jobs that most of the city workers no longer want to do. So they actually mm. fill in a very important vacuum in the city and providing crucial and essential services to the city residents, to the companies, institutions here. Mm. But in Beijing, for example, in more recent years, there is a shift of the focus. There is a talk about transferring non-capital city related functions to outside of Beijing. And I think some of the government leaders may be overly 
enthusiastic in getting that part of the job done to the neglect of the fact that these migrant workers are Chinese citizens, mm -hmm. they are law-abiding people, they want to work, they want to deliver, and they want to go through all these testing and circumstances already there to are provide serious, for their kids. There are yes. serious uh, discussions about um, the scrapping of the household registration system so that every citizen, either from the countryside or from cities, can enjoy equal benefits Absolutely. to social uh, uh, programs. Do you foresee a day that this will happen on a national level, that all over China? I think so. I think the dream for China, as President Xi Jinping has been talking about so many times to uh, fulfill and achieve the Chinese dream is that everyone in China will be treated equal and there will be no longer distinction as to where you come from a city area or rural area of China and this divide between rural China and urban China will fall down mm. and people will have complete freedom in moving around and go to wherever they choose to find a job and to work as a responsible and honorable citizen. I think that day need to come sooner or later and the sooner the better. Mm. And Claire, do you think that will happen probably in five, ten years time? And what will that be? Yeah, I'd be very excited to see that. I, when I'm born, I don't want to be tattooed worker, migrant worker. I want to have something that comes off. Mm -hmm. I want something that when I move to a city, I can progress up the social ladder. I, I can improve my opportunity. I can improve opportunities for my family. You know, I look at the people who really made a contribution to the social development of Britain, and two names come to mind. The first gentleman is called Arthur Greenwood. He, because his parents were painters and decorators, mm -hmm. he pushed through the legislation to clear the slums in Britain in 1930 with mm. the Housing Act. So because he was empowered by the platform of Parliament, he could make a legislative change for the whole country. Mm. The second person who really understood the need of the poor, that was an Iron Bevan. So he, he was in a coal mining constituency. His father was a coal miner in Wales his whole life. And he saw that when a miner broke his arm or broke his leg, he could no longer work. So he went to Parliament. He was elected as an MP. And he pushed through, in the 1940s, the legislation that created the National Health Service. Mm. So that was, means if a miner broke his arm, he could still get free health and get back to work. All that we need, all that a country needs to progress is to find these superstars in social development, present them with a platform mm. that has national significance. And I think Xi Jinping really wants to do this. I really liked it when Xi Jinping went and ate uh, Jiaozi. Uh -huh. You know, he had that fi in, in a restaurant that in I a, go in to. A common restaurant yeah, I like on the street that. corner. And I thought, oh, this guy, he wants to get down with the people. Mm. I like it. So maybe he's a leader and he's come out with his, uh, you know, let's have get rid of poverty program. I don't hear any other government saying that. Mm. So I'm quite excited by his 19 CPC speech and I look forward to seeing it mm. become a reality. So hopefully good things can count up a bad stuff. Let's hope big changes will happen in China to make every people a fair shot at life. Thank you very much, Claire, and thank you, Victor. Thank you. You've been watching Dialogue. You're on CTTN. I'm Zoe in Beijing. Goodbye for now.